you can open. Let me see if this microphone works. I'm very discombobulated without my wife. You can tell that uh, the girls' hairstyles are a la dad. And, uh, you know. And uh, announcements went okay. There's going to be something big that I forgot. I know, I know. But, um, we're doing good, and I'm glad. Uh, I want to be very supportive of women's ministries at this church, especially as we revitalize, because... Uh, there's just so much ministry that needs to happen with women that I certainly cannot do and, uh, and that your deacons cannot do. And so I pray that you all would get together, pray together, study the Bible together in whatever way seems best. And uh, so when you're available to go to a conference with each other, that's fantastic. And when you're able to have Bible studies together, that's fantastic. And today we are going to be <clears throat> in John chapter 6 and... Last Sunday, I still managed to keep it around 35-minute sermon, but man, I felt like I just went on and on. Last Sunday in chapter 5, I wanted to just breeze past the story at the beginning of the chapter. Everybody knows the story anyways, right? The, 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 par the guy that was lame at, uh, there at the pool of Bethesda, and then we would really dig into the teaching. I got done talking about the guy who got healed at the pool of Bethesda, and I looked up, and I had 10 minutes left, and I thought, Ah, uh, there should have been two sermons. Oh, well. So, today, we're going to do the stories, and then we'll do the big teaching next week, which ironically, not ironically, I guess, very appointed by the Lord, Jesus talks about being the bread of life, and we had already made plans to do the Lord's Supper next Sunday, and so that sermon will fit in right there with that as Jesus tells them all, listen, you want life? You find it in me. So uh, that is next Sunday, right? Okay, you look worried. So <laughs> I thought, oh no, don't tell me they're going to be gone. Uh, all righty. In John chapter 6, we find uh, the only miracle. Now, of course, lots of miracles happened all across the uh, four Gospels, miracles that Jesus did, but this is a very specific miracle, and it's the only one that, like the, that is specific like that that seems to be recorded in all four Gospels besides the resurrection, of course. So I thought that was pretty interesting. But we are going to get into John chapter 6, starting in verse 1. After this, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias, and a large crowd was following him because they saw the signs that he was doing on the sick. Jesus went up on the mountain, and there he sat down with his disciples. Now the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was at hand. Lifting up his eyes then, and seeing that a large crowd was coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread so that these people may eat? He said this to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, 200 denarii would not be enough to buy bread for each of them to get a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a boy who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they for so many? Jesus said, Have the people sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down, about 5,000 in number. Jesus then took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated, so also the fish as much as they wanted. And when they had eaten their fill, he told his disciples, gather up the leftover fragments that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up and filled 12 baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten. <clears throat> when the people saw the sign that he had done, they said, This is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. Perceiving then that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself. When evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, got into a boat and started across the sea to Capernaum. It was now dark. And Jesus had not yet come to them. The sea became rough because a strong wind was blowing. When they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea. And coming near the boat, they were frightened. But he said to them, It is I. Do not be afraid. And they were glad to take him into the boat. And immediately the boat was at the land to which they were going. 
Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you speak to us. We thank you, O oh Lord, that you speak to us through your written word. Father, I pray today that we would have good fellowship, that we would have a deeper understanding from your word that I would preach with what you would want me to say, uh, that this church would not just be revitalized in terms of numbers, but Lord, we are looking for a spiritual journey and a spiritual home. And I pray that you would speak to each of us individually, call us to whatever personal ministry you would have us to do, whether it's to volunteer for something here at the church or whether it is to uh, begin a new ministry here at this church or whether it is to simply represent you well at work and at home and all the places that we go to. Lord, I want to pray for the Holden area, the Pittsville area, whatever we call this area, the, the, the place that we are in geographically, Lord. Lord, some parts of Holden are very dark. And I pray that your light would shine there and that you would call people out of darkness into the light. Lord, here in suburbia where many people sleep in the Pittsville area and work and do most of their living in Kansas City, I pray, O oh Lord, that if it be your will, if there is not a Kansas City church that is reaching them, that we might reach them, that we might encounter them through some means, that we might host means for us to encounter them, that we might do something because you came to earth for us. Surely we can go across the street for you. We pray these things in your name. Amen. 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 <clears throat> Number one on your sheet, the feeding of the 5,000 is the only miracle recorded in all four Gospels. Now, of course, you have Jesus healing the blind in all four Gospels and, and cripples and various things, but as far as the same story, the exact same event happening, and of course, this, we're not talking about the resurrection, obviously, is a miracle in all four Gospels. And there's a reason why us preachers sometimes want to skip over the stories and get straight into what Jesus is talking about. Number one, because everybody loves the stories and already knows the stories, if you know anything about the Bible. Um, you probably have heard the story of the feeding of the 5,000 and Jesus walking on the water. Uh, but to tear into all of the, the teaching that John, the Apostle John, records uh, is something, it's not as exciting, but it's very necessary. But at the same time, not everybody knows their Bible. Not everybody uh, has heard these stories a hundred times. And we need to become the kind of church that is understanding towards that fact. Of course, we don't just want to drop all Bible teaching because people won't know what we're talking about anyways, which seems to be where some churches have gone sometimes, it seems, or, or perhaps our parenting has gone in that direction. You know, uh, I, I about did a cartwheel. I can't do a cartwheel. Confession time, I can't do a cartwheel. I've only done it on water. Do you know how you do a cartwheel on water? That's when the ski boat goes this way and you're on an inner tube behind it and you go this way and, and they pull up alongside you to pick you up and, and, you, and your brother goes, you did three cartwheels on top of the water. And Cool, good thing I didn't hit anything. But um, we were on a, a, a free app. They have all these streaming apps now and I don't like paying for any of them. And, and there's one you don't pay for and lo and behold, they had Davy and Goliath. Are you familiar? Nod your head if you're familiar with Davy and Goliath. And uh, it's fantastic. And people don't understand. Unless you, if, if your parents weren't like this, you need to watch at least one episode of this show, okay? Because, you know, Davy is a boy and his dog is named Goliath, okay? It's not about King David as a little boy fighting the giant Goliath. They're just named after those characters. And Davy has a sister named Sally. And only Davy can hear his dog talk, because you know what your dog's thinking, right? So anyways, um, but anytime he goes to his parents about anything, he gets an answer from the Bible. Or, well, you know, God is a lot like that. And God wants us to do this in this situation. So if your parents weren't like that, 
I encourage you to watch it. Go on to Tubi and watch a few episodes of Davy and Goliath so that you can understand how it is supposed to be at home, okay? We are training our kids, and, and I, had a, I had a second grade teacher. Her, her husband was a deacon at our church, and we asked her, what does the, what does the word descend mean and, and, uh, or ascend? And she used the example from the Bible, you know, and, and teachers would be uh, not very popular with their colleagues this, these days. Uh, but back then, uh, you know, you can, King James Bible is like the one book everybody's read, you know, so it was perfectly legitimate to answer questions about what a word means from the Bible. But anyways, um, we need to know these things. And those of us who have heard these stories over and over again, which is definitely the camp I'm in, we lose our wonder at this, okay? And we treat this as if it's the most boring stuff or it's stuff everybody knows. And, and I know that, that guilt tripping you about that is probably not the way to solve it, but are you kidding me? Thousands of people. Now, we, 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 get, we get this story in the other three Gospels as well, so we get some details. You know, uh, in, in this version, they don't spell out that they had been out there in the wilderness with Jesus preaching and teaching all day, but that was exactly what happened. I mean, you know, if you follow me down a hiking trail and want to hear me preach, I'm not necessarily going to worry about what you're having for lunch, okay? Uh, that's on you. But at some point it became obvious that they were hosting these people. They were, they were having an impromptu co uh, conference out there in the wilderness, and a logistical problem came up. And, and, it, and it is uh, something that in the other Gospels we get the impression, you know, that Jesus says, I'm the preacher. You guys handle the problem. You know, there's the, I got things to worry about. You know, Jesus is like, I'm preaching, I'm teaching, I'm healing, I'm casting out demons. I come to earth to die on the cross to save you from your sins. They didn't know all of that just yet, but, you know, and you want me to worry about what all these people are going to eat today. Now, in John, it's posed a little different. He asked Philip, so how are we going to feed all these people? And he was testing him because Jesus already knew what he was going to do. And that's one of the amazing things about the gospel according to John. John gets to an old age, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the gospel according to Matthew, the gospel according to Mark, the gospel according to Luke. They're already floating out there. We're pretty sure John knows all that. He's probably even read them. And before he dies, the rest of them all get uh, martyred. They get killed for sharing the faith uh, fairly young. And John started out as the youngest of the disciples, and he's the only one that lives to a ripe old age. In fact, there were some, some famous men from history, famous for being in the church, that claimed to have sat at the feet of an elderly John when they were children. And so when we, when we wonder what John means about a phrase or something like that, we try to look up and see what those men said. They would probably have a pretty good idea. But uh, before he goes on to be with the Lord, he wants to sit down and write, a gospel story, the life of Jesus. And if he was looking to tell us everything that we were not told in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, he did an excellent job. We get so much stuff in John that is not in the other gospels. And that probably was his desire and his goal. But John, John practically, you know, if you were there, and we have a, we have a storybook about Jesus and Every time we get it out, my kids are like, what is that? It's Jesus' halo. He has it in every situation. Now, if you were there in person, you would not see a halo on Jesus. Jesus looks like all the other guys, especially since they all had turbans and beards and robes. They just probably got lose him in the crowd pretty easily. But even in John's gospel, man, it sure does seem like, Je boy, that's the special one. That's the Son of God right there. The way that John tells the story it should have been obvious all along. This man was sent by God. In fact, the title of the sermon today, Who is He? Part 11. And then it gets even more confusing, Provider and King, Part 1. So this is a two-parter inside of a many, many, many-parted series. But today we're going to talk about Provider and King. Uh, da, 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 da. The second half of number one on your sheet, Jesus is so popular he can get no rest. The folks have followed him. 
out here. And I think that's amazing because Jesus says a lot of things that would not make him very popular today. And I want you to understand as we go through John, and even though he is the crowd pleaser who feeds thousands of people with bread and fish, he winds up somewhat not happy about it. You follow me because you want to get fed. And I'm trying to tell you, well, anyways, that's next week's sermon. But we're going to see this. This is going to get referred to in the book of John. And he's going to be trying to explain to people, listen, I know I fed the crowds, but you guys, you, you think only about that. And I'm here to offer you something so much more. And people were hungry enough for it that they went out into the wilderness following Jesus, following his disciples, and they would sit anywhere and listen to him. And of course, they were bringing him the sick and the lame and the demon-possessed, and Jesus was solving all of that. So Jesus can get no rest. The crowds follow him into a remote place. <clears throat> Number two, John tells us Jesus already knew what he was going to do. 200 days wages would not feed this crowd. Now your Bible says 200 denarii, and a denarius was the coin that you as a day laborer, that you would, uh, uh, you would go to work. They felt like if, if they waited till the end of the week to pay you, you probably weren't going to get paid. I don't know. I worked at a factory once, and we went from weekly paychecks to double weekly, and there was murmurs all over the place. Oh, company's going under. They can't pay us every week. Money's tied up somewhere else. Uh-oh. Back in ancient times, they found you where the people, where the men gathered to go work in the fields for a day, and they would hire you that day, and they would pay you a denarius at the end of the day. So I don't know what your daily wage is, but that 200 denarii is 200 days' wages. So they're talking about an astronomical amount of money, and even that would not be enough to buy food. What are we going to do? In fact, we know of one boy who brought his lunch. And I was going to put something in here about it must have been great faith. Great faith for Andrew to come forward and say, I found food, Jesus. I know you can work with this five loaves and two fish. But then I got really to thinking about it. Probably everyone was super frustrated, and they're like, we have searched high. We have searched low. We found one boy who brought his lunch. What on earth are we going to do with this? So probably it wasn't a great act of faith. But Jesus says, have everyone sit down, bring the lunch here, praise over it, and as they begin to distribute it, it just keeps going. And the number one top headliner story from the Old Testament that this should make you think of is when the children of Israel were on their way from the land of Egypt where they had been slaves and God had set them free to the promised land God began to provide manna in the desert for thousands, hundreds of thousands, if not a couple million people. We're not sure exactly how many people were there. Uh, to take the numbers in the Bible very literally, it was hundreds of thousands of men. And if each man had a wife and a kid, it gets up into the two and a half million mark. And we got a lot of Bible scholars that say, that's impossible. Well, I wasn't there. So... I believe the number's in the Bible. But anyways, it's remarkable. That's what it is. Whether it's hundreds of thousands or millions, it's still a remarkable miracle that God has something in the desert, in the wilderness, suddenly provided every morning that they could get up and they could eat. Now, I'm not going to go into all the details of the manna provided in the wilderness, but even though it was this great, fantastic miracle of God, it came with a couple of very sad. There, there's always a cloud to every silver lining, right? And they were commanded not to gather it on the Sabbath because it wouldn't be there. The rest of the week, you gather it, and you don't gather more than you're going to eat that day. And sure enough, some people tried, and it would spoil overnight. You could not store it. And God told them from the beginning, I'm going to send you this manna to test you. I just gave you the Ten Commandments. You're not going to work on the Sabbath. So on the Sabbath day, the day before the Sabbath, you gather enough for two days, and you don't go out to gather on the Sabbath. And, of course, they pushed the envelope. They pushed their limits with God. 
They tried to gather for two days every day because, oh man, we're in the desert, we're in the wilderness. This may not be here tomorrow. They didn't trust God. And, and, uh, and they tried to store it overnight and it grew worms immediately. They stored it for two days on the day before the Sabbath and it kept for the Sabbath. And a few people who weren't with the program went out and tried to look for it and couldn't find any on the Sabbath. And so God got angry with them for trying to disobey him even though he was providing for them. And we're going to see something similar here. Jesus does this fantastic miracle and the only thing people are going to worry about is whether or not their belly is full. I'm going to do number two again in case you missed any blanks. John tells us Jesus already knew what he, what he was going to do. 200 days wages would not feed this crowd. We know of one boy who brought his lunch. This miracle points back to the miracle of the manna in the wilderness. And sure enough, <clears throat> they've been waiting for the Messiah. They've been waiting for the special anointed one from God. And here is someone who not only has power over disease, power to turn water into wine, which of course would make Jesus very popular all by itself, but he has the power to feed the people. What if the Romans try to starve us out? What if we ignite this glorious Jewish rebellion so that we can take back our land and overthrow the Roman Empire and they surround us and we can't get to food? What's going to happen? This Messiah, this anointed one, this one that we are all starting to think that maybe we're willing to follow him even to death, he can provide in the wilderness. But as I've mentioned before, we're going to see that if that is all you can think about, if that is all you can see, we want you to have the wonder of this miracle. This is nothing to sneeze at. By the way, Elijah also did exactly this kind of thing. He shows up at a widow's house during a drought. This year, we've learned a little bit about drought. Not quite like they had. <laughs> Hadn't rained in three years. But, but he shows up and she says, I'd love to feed you, man of God, but I got a little bit of oil. I got a little bit of flour. I was going to make a loaf of bread for me and my son to eat, and then we were just going to die. Just wait to die. That's how bad the situation is. And he says, make it for me instead. And they feed the man of God first, and they go back to the oil, and there's still more oil in there. And they go back to the flour, and there's still more flour in there. And they continued. He lived there with them, and they continued to eat. And they were, no matter how much oil and how much flour they stirred together to make bread, there was always more left. This is very similar to more than one Old Testament story where God provided. So God will provide. God will provide. And God will provide to a church that feels like it's, it's, it's in a spiritual wilderness and no matter what we do, it just doesn't seem to work. And God will provide, but you've got to hang on. You've got to, you've got to have faith in God even through the tough times. It's easy to have uh, faith in God during the easy times. In fact, we often... Uh, uh, we, we want to release our hold on God. Things are going good. We don't need God. We'll just work ourselves, you know, and so God sends us hard times, but don't despair during the hard times. God still has his hand on you. Maybe you need that message in your personal life today, but we need to think about more than just having our bellies full and having our bank account full. In fact, I really feel like one of the verses that we want to focus on today is verse 15, perceiving that when they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself. Number three on your sheet, Jesus does not want to be made king. Can you imagine? Who's ever turned this down? Uh... From my understanding, historically, George Washington did. He was so popular after the Revolutionary War that uh, the European power sat back and said, we read the Declaration of Independence, watch, they'll make this guy king instead. And he walked away from it all. He wouldn't become our first president for several years after that. And of course, George Washington was from a Christian society that believed in those kinds of values. Not everybody had the character like him to turn it down. 
And are we supposed to go on and on about how humble Jesus was and how wanting to be the king and wanting to prop yourself up is a bad thing? I don't think that's the point of this. I think that we need to remember that becoming an earthly king was very different than the mission Jesus was on, which is why this church needs to ask itself, what mission are we on? Are we trying to become the biggest, most popular church in the area? Am I trying to become the most famous, popular, sounding good preacher we've ever heard? I tell you what, man, sometimes you don't even realize in the ministry that that has become your goal without you realizing it. And I've, I've watched many interviews. Nobody reads books anymore. Uh, I've watched many interviews with a lot of big church pastors and everything, and a lot of them had a mental breakdown at some point. Why? Well, they felt the weight of this huge congregation on them and had been operating under the assumption that it was all about them. And I feel that way many times. It's all about me. If I don't do this over here, if I don't do that over here, if, if, if not enough people show up on a Sunday because it's summer and everybody's at the lake, or if it's fall and the weather's finally nice, or, or there's all these things going on, man, this is, this is a problem. This reflects poorly on me. What am I going to do? And we can't, we can't let it be about me, and I hope that's fairly obvious. And we can't even let it be about our church. And many times church members, uh, they'll have a pet project, a pet ministry, something that they support, uh, or, or at least something that, that feels <clears throat> like it's theirs or it's, a, or it's a comfort to them. And we don't want to let go. You've, you've made it all about them, and you're supposed to make it about Jesus. And how do we know it's about Jesus in your life? Well, if you want... If you read the book about Jesus a lot, that's a pretty good indicator. If you, if you learn enough, if you come to your pastor or others with questions about Jesus, you obviously have a fixation on Jesus. We want you to have a fixation on Jesus. And Jesus said, go and make disciples. And that needs to be the goal of our church. Now, I know some churches put on big productions and they do a lot of really, uh, uh, how do I say this? entertaining things, and it looks like they're winning a lot of people to the gospel because, look, there's a lot of people there. And I'm not even here to say that that is bad because I know a lot of big churches with big production value, they're doing the thing our culture needs because, you know, people show up and there's amateur guitar player who forgot his good guitar today. And, and, and there's amateur bass player, and there's, there's the, the videos were too loud, and the music was too soft, or the music was too loud, and the videos were too soft, or something like that. I don't like this. You know, there's a lot of people in our society, they see amateur hour, and they say, I'm out. So just to get past that first barrier, I believe many of these big churches are doing the work of God. Unfortunately, it's easy to pick on the big churches. A lot of them have sold their souls to be popular instead of making true disciples. And so there's both sides. And we want to take things seriously. We want a nice building for people to come in so that they can at least see that we take care of things around here. We want to take care with the Sunday morning worship, especially if we're going to use it as our point of entry with people. But that's not the point of entry with a lot of people. Sometimes they bring their son on a RA event, or they come to a tea party with the GAs, they bring their kids. A lot of people's lives revolve around their kids these days. It wasn't always like that, but it is now. And, and so Sunday morning worship may not necessarily be the entry point for a lot of these people. Uh, but we have to have the right mission in mind. And Jesus is going to make disciples, and Jesus is going to die for the sins of the world, and Jesus is going to take on the devil and being made earthly king of a little kingdom in what we call Palestine, that's not a part of the plan. That's not a part of the plan. Jesus is very aware of what his plan is, his mission that he has been sent on by God the Father. And so I believe that even though it's good to be humble, and we should all try to be like Jesus, and that includes humility, more importantly, our humility needs to be genuine because we know what the plan is to make disciples, to represent Jesus, whether it's a popular 
uh, message that Jesus wants us to give people like, hey, you need to love each other and you need to take care of each other, or whether we have to go over to the other side of the same message and say, and if you rebel against God, you're going to hell. It's all truth. We need to love truth because truth is the only thing that sets us free according to the Bible. And we need to be ready for all of it. We need to love all of it and represent all of it because that is the mission, not to be popular necessarily. To be popular, of course, can be a part of the mission if it will help you attain your ultimate goals that are the real mission. Number three, again, Jesus does not want to be made king. Providing bread is not the point of Jesus' ministry. I believe in feeding the hungry, but that gets to be a very complicated ministry. Trust me, I do the treasure for the food center. There's people going there that shouldn't be. There's a lot of people who need it who won't go. Maybe there'll be a whole sermon on that sometime. People often only care about their bellies being full. And that's not just about the natural need for hunger. There are other appetites that our bodies have, and so much of our life is about chasing after those things. Number four, here is the last thing that I want to drive home to you about Jesus not wanting to be made their earthly king. To multiply food and walk on water means Jesus is king of I'm going to let you guess. I know. It's usually a trap whenever I let you guess. But To multiply food and walk on water means Jesus is king of many similar answers being shared. Everything is, what I was, is how I said it. Jesus is king of everything. It's, it's so ironic. They want to make him king. It's like, <laughs> you're a little late. You're a little late. I can walk on water, okay? I'm not worried about sharks. Even if they pop out of the water at me, I tell them to go away, okay? Disease, I tell it to go away. Demons, they're scared of me. Jesus is king. Jesus is king. And as we'll see next Sunday, they would show up now, lots of people. We'll, we'll get sermon and a meal. This church knows what I'm talking about, right? You guys think a meal will solve everything. And it's a lot of nervous. The, the only laughter is nervous <laughs> laughter. So, yeah, that's us. I've struck a chord. We're going to be working on that over time, folks. We want you to eat. I need to eat a little less. The girls tell me that mommy has a big belly. We're due in February. And that daddy has a big belly. And I got no due date. I'm going to have to make that myself. So I'm going to eat a little less. But... but um, that they, they're laughing because they know that's exactly what they say. And, but folks, ah, Jesus is king. And if you want bread next Sunday, Jesus is the bread of life. He offers something so much better than meal or even a lifetime of meals. You will never go spiritually hungry again, even if you're living in a cardboard box. You will never be spiritually thirsty again because what Jesus offers sprouts up like a, it shoots out like a fountain, like a spring in your soul. Something we don't even hardly have around here. I know you're going to be telling me examples after church, but for me it was everywhere you dug a hole in the ground where I grew up, okay? So this seems like a desert to me, but you will never be hungry or spiritually thirsty again. And that's incredible. And it's because you know the king. And we want to introduce you to the king. And if you already come to church and you already are a Christian, but you don't feel like you know the king and you are spiritually hungry and you are spiritually thirsty and there's something that you are, is missing in your life, we want to help you understand you shouldn't be missing anything in your life because you have Jesus and he is everything. And we want to counsel with you and we want to pray with you and we want to 
help attack all of the troubles in life that come up against you because uh, there's going to be so much from today when we're feeling good at church and that day when we go home to be with Jesus. There's day-to-day -day life in there. We want to help you with that, and we want to make you into a disciple, a follower of Jesus, so that whenever the evil one comes against you and we're not there to help, it doesn't matter because you've got Jesus. We want to show you how to do that, teach you how to do that, and maybe that will involve confronting you about some things that you don't want to be confronted about, but trust Jesus. It is all a part of the process because we don't want to confront you out of our pride. Hopefully, if the church is doing its job, the leaders, the teachers, uh, whoever you pick as maybe a mentor figure or something, we can confront you about things that Jesus would confront you about. With Jesus living inside of us and the Holy Spirit speaking to us, if we all lock arms and we confront the things that Jesus would want to confront you with, it will be a good thing. And you'll be, like John says, you know, taking that stuff out of darkness and exposing it to the light. And, and Jesus loves you anyways, no matter what he can see that you're up to in the darkness. We want help and hope and healing for you in the light.